Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Ko Sophie Metz Toko Ingwa. Asparagopsis armata is a native New Zealand seaweed that has the potential to drastically reduce our methane emissions. But before we get to the solution, we need to understand the problem. Climate change barely needs an introduction. As we know, the main contributing factor is greenhouse gas emissions. And if we look at New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions by sector, we can see that agriculture is the largest contributor. The source of these agricultural emissions is mostly from livestock, causing almost 80% of emissions, and the gas they're emitting is methane. So we've identified the problem of agricultural methane emissions, but we can't just get rid of New Zealand's agricultural sector because it's incredibly important to our economy. It's our 10th largest industry. So we'll need a solution that can maintain a productive and viable agricultural sector, and that protects New Zealand's clean, green reputation. A solution would ideally promote the health of the land and the waterways and build off existing resources. One place to start looking for solutions is to traditional knowledge. Mataranga Māori describes the body of knowledge stemming from a Māori worldview and traditional practices. Māori have always been aware of the connection between the land and the sea. Tangaroa and Rongomatane, the Atua, deities of the sea and cultivated food respectively, were brothers. And so whilst farming practices have changed with the introduction of ruminants to New Zealand, terrestrial uses for limurimu, seaweed, are not a new concept. Traditional uses included as a fertiliser, and the seaweed karingo, which you might know as nori, was a delicacy. If we look at the other side of the world, there is anecdotal evidence from as far back as the ancient Greeks of the benefits of coastal ruminant farming. So, using a seaweed to tackle methane emissions from ruminants just extends these ideas. There are two species of Asparagopsis. Asparagopsis armata, which grows in temperate climates like that of New Zealand, and Asparagopsis taxiformis, its tropical cousin. Both get their red colour from high concentrations of bromoform, which is used as a defence mechanism, and it's also this property that allows it to reduce methane emissions, as we'll see later. This can be freeze-dried into a supplement like this, that can then be fed directly to cattle or other ruminants. This was given to me by New Zealand company CH4 Global. Let's take a closer look at how methane is produced. Enteric fermentation describes the process of how food is broken down in the cow's rumen. There are a whole host of microorganisms that inhabit the rumen and help break down food, and some of them produce waste products too. Methane is a waste product produced by just one group, the methanogens. These are all from the domain archaea, which means they're single-celled prokaryotic organisms a bit like bacteria. There are over 50 described species and they produce methane from hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Although the pathway differs between species, the final set is the same across all species, and it's this that is targeted by an asparagopsis additive. As we've noted, it's a complex process requiring various enzymes and coenzymes, and the final step is no different, requiring two enzymes and a coenzyme F430. Now, various substances have been shown to be antimethanogenic, and these include the halogenated methane analogues, that's things like bromoform or chloroform. However, the use of artificially formulated HMAs is banned due to their ozone depleting effects. So, how does this inhibition work? Well, let's take a closer look at this final step. We can break it into two parts. The transfer of a methyl, that's a CH3 group, onto a substrate to form coenzyme M, and then the reduction of that to produce methane. So how does this happen? Well, it needs an enzyme, a transferase enzyme. An enzyme is a protein that's folded into a specific shape so that it can hold molecules in a specific arrangement and lower the energy required for a reaction to occur. It catalyzes reactions. And we can think of it a little bit like this Lego creation. Some enzymes need a coenzyme to function that binds to their active site. In this case, it's coenzyme F430. This then allows the substrate to bind to the enzyme's active site and react to produce coenzyme M. In the next part of the final step, this is reduced by a reductant to produce methane. That means a hydrogen is added to the CH3 group. So how does this inhibition work? Well, competitive inhibition is the name of a process by which another chemical substance occupies an enzyme's active site preventing either a coenzyme or substrate from entering it and thus preventing a reaction from occurring. Now, 
Bromyl form can react with a reduced form of vitamin B12 to form a substance that resembles coenzyme F430 enough to be able to bind to the enzyme specifically shaped active site and thus prevent the substrate, the coenzyme, from entering it and so no reaction occurs. There is also some evidence to suggest that other haloalkanes found at lower concentrations in the asparagopsis may be structural analogues to methyl coenzyme M and so be able to occupy the active site of the reductase enzyme and prevent methane from forming as well. In the first case, if no methyl coenzyme M is produced, then no methane can be produced either. So this has been investigated in various studies using both Asparagopsis amata and Taxiformis, and from sheep to dairy to beef cattle. And it's astonishingly effective. Up to 98% less methane was produced in one study, and there were no traces of bromoform in the meat or milk, which is important, as in large quantities it can be harmful to human health. There was also an improvement in productivity noted, and this helps us get a better picture of what's going on. Normally, approximately 12% of feed energy is lost to methane production. And so we can explain the increase in average daily weight gain of the cattle as energy that would have gone on to produce methane, a waste product, being used to produce more useful products to the cow. These include volatile fatty acids. Two such VFAs are acetate and propionate. Studies also note a shift in the acetate to propionate ratio towards propionate. Now propionate contains more carbon than acetate, and so this is telling us that probably some of the carbon dioxide that would have been used to produce methane is now being used to form propionate. It will also need to be monitored as big changes in the acetate to propionate ratio can have implications on milk fat and even cattle health. What happens to the rest of the hydrogen and carbon dioxide that would have been used to produce methane? Well, it's eurectated, that is, burped out by the cow. So, unfortunately, this is not going to be a silver bullet to completely reduce emissions of biogenic greenhouse gases. However, I believe it will be a useful tool in tackling emissions of methane, which is 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And this leads us on to the, uh, to the benefits to New Zealand. Economically, this will help contribute to the government's target of a $3 billion aquaculture industry by 2035. It will create new jobs in aquaculture and protect those in agriculture by future-proofing the, the industry and reducing its emissions. It's also got excellent export potential. Countries all over the world are grappling with this same problem. And so, even if New Zealand chooses to transition its economy away from agriculture, this product will remain in demand and it's also suitable for use on organic farms. New Zealand is just starting to realise this potential. Last year, there was $100,000 invested uh, to Nelson's Cawthorn Institute for a one-year pilot project, and $500,000 went from the Provincial Growth Fund to New Zealand company CH4 Global for their Southland operations. I was fortunate enough to be able to talk with Alan Groves and Guy Royal of CH4 Global about their Southland operations, on Rakiura, Stewart Island. And there are various co-benefits of cultivating Asparagopsis alamata there. As some of you may know, this is home to the Sanford Salmon Farm, and salmon farming produces a high level of nitrates. Fortunately, Asparagopsis alamata grows well in a nitrate-rich environment, and so can help remove some of the excess nitrates from the sea. It will also be capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it grows. And this leads us on to the environmental benefits. Researchers estimate that if just 10% of global ruminant producers adopted an asparagopsis additive, it would have the same impact for our climate as removing 50 million cars from the world's roads. We can also look at it in terms of our zero carbon act commitment to reduce emissions of biogenic methane. So if we conservatively assume an asparagopsis additive would be 70% effective, and our 2018 methane emissions, then if those responsible for just 67.1% of methane emissions adopted an asparagopsis additive, this commitment would be fulfilled. But climate change isn't just an environmental issue, it's a social issue too, because it will exacerbate existing inequalities. A climate justice response means prioritising those most affected, and this could be because of geographic exposure or socio-economic factors. In New Zealand, 
one community which will be disproportionately, disproportionately affected by climate change is Māori, who continue to be disadvantaged by colonialism. Māori also has had significant investments in New Zealand's primary industries, and these are most at risk from climate change, exacerbating droughts, leading to other extreme weather events, even increasing the risk of new pest species. So, by working with Māori to co-develop in the aquaculture space and ensure that all new developments accord with Te Tiriti o Waitangi, we could create new jobs in aquaculture and safeguard our existing agricultural industry and those who depend on it. But, like any new project, there are some limitations and considerations. The long-term effects are unknown. The longest trial to date has been 90 days, and it's possible that over time, microorganisms could adapt to an additive and can continue to produce methane. The efficacy of the supplement also depends on an animal's diet, so more trials under different feeding regimes will be required to determine the correct amount to feed them. Research into an aquaculture production system that is both sustainable and scalable will also be necessary. Fortunately, CH4 Global don't foresee this to be a major barrier. Finally, Large-scale uptake may be costly to start with, and it may require an economic incentive. Under the current emissions trading scheme, emissions of biogenic methane aren't included, and so there is little economic incentive for farmers. So, whether support comes in the form of a government investment, or the swift inclusion of biogenic methane in the emissions trading scheme um, will have to be seen, but either of these options could alleviate um, this issue. So, to conclude, this is a sustainable, effective and environmentally, solution, environmentally friendly solution to New Zealand's methane emissions. There are environmental benefits to New Zealand and the rest of the world, as well as economic and social benefits. Nore rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.